On Wednesday, September 30th, President Trump seemed more than fine. Here he is at 2.30 p.m. We're going to Minnesota. I thought the uh, debate last night was great. We've gotten tremendous reviews on it. Minnesota matters to the president. He lost the state in 2016, but wants to flip it this year. He arrived early at 5.15 Eastern, made time for a private fundraiser before heading to a rally at 9. COVID wasn't talked about much there, except for suggestions the economy would soon soar. And now we're opening it up, and we're doing it at a level like nobody's ever seen before. And it's a great thing, and we're going to be back in business very soon. The virus wasn't just in the speech, it was in the air. The New York Times reports that it was at that rally that Trump advisor Hope Hicks started feeling ill. By the time the Trump team boarded Air Force One Wednesday night, Hicks was sick enough to be quarantined on the plane. So Wednesday, almost done, and look at Trump's potential contact list. Beyond the private donors, the public, the Secret Service and military, hundreds of people, it's his inner circle, including Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump, senior advisor Stephen Miller, and at that point, the already symptomatic Hope Hicks. When they landed at Andrews Air Force Base at 12.10 a.m. Thursday, October 1st, Hicks, deplaned through the back staircase, was tested not long after. The president was about to have a busy day. As president, I Thursday want to morning, he Catholic recorded remarks for an annual Catholic charity dinner. The end of the pandemic is in sight, and next year will be one of the greatest years in the history of our country. At 1.14 p.m. Thursday, Trump heads to his Bedminster, New Jersey golf club for a fundraiser with hundreds of supporters. Some aides scrap plans to join him at the last minute after learning Hicks had tested positive. We now know the White House made the call for the president and other aides to carry on. It was deemed safe for the president to go. Um, he socially distanced. It was an outdoor event and it was deemed safe. But those in attendance say there was at least one indoor event in which 19 people sat with him for roughly 45 minutes. He didn't wear a mask. Attendees were tested for COVID before the meeting. They're being tested again. There's some reporting he was raspy voiced and tired in New Jersey. This is where symptoms may have first appeared. The White House, by the way, did not publicly disclose the positive test of Hope Hicks, nor did it inform Joe Biden's team. News only emerged after eight when a Bloomberg journalist broke that story. The president then appeared on Fox News at 9.49 p.m. She did test positive. I just heard about this. She tested positive. We now know he hadn't just learned about it. He'd known for the bulk of the day. At 12.54 a.m., Friday, October 2nd, the president tweeted he and the first lady had tested positive. And so the end of a long night in the longest and strangest of years. So what we don't yet know is whether President Trump will ultimately end up with a mild case of COVID-19 and emerge okay, or if he will struggle with a more serious case. And the implications could be very different depending on how he fares. So joining us to discuss this from Washington are David Frum, senior editor at The Atlantic, and Neera Tandon, former Obama staffer and current president of the Center for American Progress. So let, let's talk implications. Given either scenario for the election, where Americans are already voting. David, let's start with you. I don't think the election implications are all that big. Look, we've seen the economy plunge from the best American economy since the late 1990s to the worst American economy since the Great Depression. Um, and in that time, the lines of support for the president and the, his opponents have not really budged. Uh, the majority of Americans have been opposed to the president every single day of his presidency. Uh, through his presidency, about 43, 44 percent of Americans, sometimes as high as 45 percent, have supported him. Um, his catastrophic debate performance, I doubt, moved things very much. I don't think this latest diagnosis will move things very much. And what about you, Neera? I disagree a little with David in that, uh, you know, there, there. while the polls have been relatively stable, there have been movements in the polls, and the movements in the polls correspond with how much coronavirus is in the news. So we saw over the summer with the second surge, the, uh, the surge in the red states, the Texas, Florida the virus really uh, captured the news, and it, it, it affected Donald Trump's ratings. There was, the polls widened a bit, and in this race, one or two points makes a big difference. And I think in this case, we have Donald Trump. His his own experience of, of testing positive is an illustration of his administration's failure to contain the virus. And I think for 
independent voters who are already concerned about the virus that just make the virus and his uh, failing uh, top of mind. So you, Nira, actually had COVID this month, um, this summer, rather, and, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. what your thoughts are now realizing that he has it. Well, uh, every case is obviously different, but I would say that uh, how you feel at the beginning of the onset of symptoms can be very different from the middle or end. So, and that that is relatively common. Uh, people experience their worst symptoms, um, usually between day five uh, and 10 or 14, so in your second week. I felt, you know, sick, but not incredibly sick in my first few days. And then I was completely wiped out in my second week of the virus. Mm -hmm. So how the president feels now mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, is not necessarily how he will feel in the days to come. People do deteriorate very quickly. Uh, and then they, you know, obviously we all hope that the president recovers and recovers as soon as possible. But I think uh, the days ahead could be incredibly important. So, David, we know there are protocols. We, we've been talking about this yeah. this evening for managing power at this point. But, you know, protocols and reality are different <laughs> things. What, what are you concerned about right now? Look, this White House um, is, is a chaos. It's always been a chaos. It's never been properly run. The one chief of staff who tried to make Donald Trump do some work sometimes, John Kelly, was fired for trying to make Donald Trump do some work sometimes. Uh, this is a dangerous world full of prowling predators. Um, and the United States is not as powerful as it used to be. Uh, it, and the United States, India and China are facing off against one another. It's a world of dangers. And they sense that the United States has no government. It's had for four years, or nearly so, the laziest president in American history. Now that laziest president in American history is also depleted. And one other thing we know about Donald Trump is he does not accept the handover of power. The last time the United States president had a serious health crisis was when Ronald Reagan was assassinated, or nearly assassinated in 1981. And he was in the hospital for a while. His administration drew up the paperwork to hand over power to George H.W. Bush, the vice president. It turned out not to be necessary because Reagan made a miraculously fast recovery. But Reagan cooperated, H.W. Bush Bush cooperated. Nothing like that is going to happen in the Trump White House. President Trump is jealous, fearful, and vindictive. He's not going to let Mike Pence stand in, and that means there's no president. All right. Uh, okay. Listen, information and questions obviously will evolve. We will obviously stay on it, and I know we will hear from both of you again. Neera Tandon, David Frum, thank you. Thank you.